Hello and welcome back to Shaper Sessions. Today is Thursday, as you all know, and we are here to talk about Illustrator and Origin. Uh, we're going to kind of walk through kind of what you need to know about Illustrator. It's a very complex program, but we don't always need to know everything. So we're going to focus on what you need to know for building Origin projects. And I have today with me uh, Eric, who's head of the Shaper Assist program. He's going to kind of show us all his tips and tricks as we walk through these projects. I'm Sean. Uh, and I am a product manager at Shaper Tools. So mm -hmm. let's jump into the slides. Mm -hmm. If this is your first time learning about design software, Illustrator may not be the right program for you. With that said, we did a session a couple months ago about kind of how do you think about 2D and 3D design software, a beginner's guide on uh, sessions. That was a live session we recorded. It's available for you. So you can go on the website and check that out at our YouTube page. It's a really good primer for learning all the basics of design software and kind of what you need to know when you're thinking about picking a design software with the type of projects you're going to be working with. Now, when we talk about Illustrator, you know, I quickly want to go over this. We go over that in the last uh, session that I just mentioned. There's really two real things to understand about this when we talk about design software for Origin. There's raster programs, which are really for photos like JPEGs, GIFs, PNGs. These are like you know, Photoshop, these kind of programs that really make it easy to edit photos. Now, when we think about stuff where you're going to be building for origin, you really want to be thinking in vector. And this is because of these two images where you see, if we design an S in a raster program and we blow it up, we're going to see it, it gets really blurry. But if we do it in a vector program, no matter how big or small we make it, it'll be very crystal clear. And that's because SVG, which is the file format that we take into origin, actually stands for Scalable Vector Graphics. Now, if you look at the two images on the other side, you'll actually see one looks like an image, and one looks like the image with a bunch of points on it. The points are actually the mathematical representation for this image. So these are really nice file format to work with. There's a lot of programs out there, but really when we're thinking about Illustrator, we're thinking about vector files, and you know that's kind of the this one primer, especially if you're new to really think about. So. So we, we're going to talk about where does Illustrator really sit in this 2D design software area because there's a bunch of programs. And, and I really like to think of it in two ways. There's a price point, how much you're paying for this product, and then how many features are involved in each. And so on the light end of features, we have Vector.com. We've done some videos online about that. It's a really awesome program, but you know, it doesn't have the full feature set of a lot of the other ones. There's also Inkscape, Affinity Designer. If you notice, Adobe Illustrator, I've kind of put in the far top corner because it is quite expensive and it's really feature packed. So it's just really important to think about this when you're thinking about all the different software programs because depending on what you're gonna do, you're gonna need different programs. So that's just kind of a nice way to think about where it lies in the, in the realm of all the other ones. Now, when we talk about Illustrator specifically, it's a 2D vector program that does mainly industry and pro focus. So this is like productivity, efficiency, when people think of Illustrator, they really think of web, graphics, and print. You're looking at this image here. It's, you know, it's a really complex thing that you're going to be changing over and over. The size of things is very important. The layout, all this kind of stuff. And then you want to be able to print it larger, smaller, no matter what, and have a lot of that stuff just kind of pop into, and it works. But, you know, Illustrator is very expensive. It's $33 a month. A lot of the other ones we've talked about on the previous slide are much less than that. So when we're thinking Illustrator, it's really kind of a a really high level of productivity and efficiency, and that's what you're paying for. We're going to go through a lot of the features later, but it's, it's really packed. But that kind of brings us to the next thing that I want to talk about, which is where does Illustrator and Origin fit together? Because what I'm telling you is that Illustrator is this power program, and, and it is, uh, but I also want people to realize that it's actually quite simple, and you know we can get a lot out of Illustrator with the kind of the productivity that it delivers without having to know everything in there, right? There's a lot of stuff for graphic designers, for print media that we don't really need. We just, we want to make signs. We want to make images that are turned into vectors. There, there's a lot of cool stuff that we can go through and we're going to go through a lot of that today. So Illustrator does an insane amount of things and we only need a few of them. So of the thousands it can do, it can get overwhelming with the huge drop-down menus of different things to choose, but we just use a specific few tools in Origin to really optimize. And then, you know, one other thing to think about is there's, there's really like a long video that Sam did that walks through all the basics of 
everything you need to know, right? We're going to go through a lot of and stuff here, but we're going to kind of skip over some of this stuff. Uh, his video really walks through everything you need to know and make that specific project. So, you know, you can always watch that on the YouTube as well. And like I said, you know, Illustrator is a very powerful program, but you may find yourself struggling. You may find yourself, you know, I really don't want to do 2D design at all. I just want to get in the wood shop. You know, we have Shaper Assist. This is the program that Eric runs. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a great way to get into the wood shop so you don't have to work with software. But mm -hmm. if you want to work with the software, we're about to show you everything we know, and hopefully that will get you started. So There is a lot to learn about these design softwares, and if you want to do anything technical straight off the bat and don't feel comfortable jumping on it yourself or just have questions about how to approach, please reach out to Shaper Assist, and I'll happy to walk you through different ways we can approach projects, different ways to cut it, different design methods to optimize the project for you. It also does more of a sanity check on your project to be like, is this cuttable? How is this convertible? From an image to a reference photo to random design files to files that you don't even know what they are, send them over, we'll check them out, and then we can uh, discuss what kind of, what we can do with them and how feasible the projects are. That's it for today on slides. We're going to go through and do the rest of it in a demo. We're going to do some overview of the UI for people who haven't gotten used to or even seen Illustrator ever before. Then we're going to go over that kind of simplified feature set that I think is really important to go over for origin use. And then we're going to go over a few different projects. <laughs> All right, so let's get started. Eric, you ready? So ready. All right, so here we go. So, All right, so we're, we've just opened Illustrator. We're at the main UI. Uh, you'll notice there's a few things to look at. We have this kind of toolbar on the left side, which has a bunch of little options in it. You know, like I said, Illustrator has all sorts of powerful things in it. We're not going to go through half of this, but we're going to hit the ones that we think really matter. Uh, and then on the right side, we have a layer menu, which kind of organizes all the objects you have in your in your area. So let's start with a quick thing, Eric. Uh, we're just going to pan around the, the area so we can show you how you move around. So you can use the you can use the scroll mouse to go up and down. So first, what we're looking at is our artboard, and the artboard is just a uh, size that you can change. That is just kind of like your working space. You can move things outside the artboard. It just kind of gives you a context size of where you're working and what you're doing. So you can def you're not restricted to anything. You can definitely move things around but this is just kind of like your dedicated working space. So you don't get lost in like the void of Illustrator. This kind of keeps, so everything we'll be doing is in the artboard. Yeah, so, so in, in, like you said, you can zoom in and out, you can pan around, mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe explain a little bit more about how to do each of those features real quick. Yeah, so if you want to pan around, there is a little hand tool right here. And so if you grab that, you can just kind of grab and pull to move wherever you want to go. Um, I've been doing this a lot, so to speed, time, speed up time in keystrokes, if you hold down space and do the same thing, it does that exactly. You just hold on space and grab, and it moves you wherever you want to go. Uh, you can also zoom in and out. And so if you hold down Alt and your uh, scroll wheel on your mouse, that will bring you in and out. Um, also, if you do control plus, that'll zoom you in to whatever you're highlighted on. Yeah, and I think when we, when we think of these high production software suites, there's always 10 ways to do stuff. So we're going we're gonna to show you a couple of the ways. There's probably more. Um, these are just kind of some of the ones. And, and you know, you'll find that you'll end up using one or the other. Maybe you don't ever use this type. There's actually even a whole zoom tool on the, on the palette. In the uh, in where you can zoom around. So, so that's that's the basic movement around the UI. Okay. So now let's quickly get into what's important about mm -hmm. Origin shapes. So, when we think about what we're doing on Origin, we're just defining a bunch of shapes in this program, and then we're kind of exporting those out to Origin to cut them. So, so quickly, uh, Eric's going to show you a couple of the basic built-in shapes and how we can manipulate those. So, on the left-hand toolbar, you'll see this rectangle. Um, if you hold on that, it'll give you a few options of different basic shapes. So rectangle, rectangle around corners, ellipses, uh, and polygon. Uh, so if we start with a rectangle, you can either do two things. You can click and hold and drag. Oh, 
if I've got to click the rectangle, click and hold and drag, and then that will give you whatever size you want. And you can see it's telling you that this is six inches wide by five inches high. Um, if you click and release, it'll bring up this window that you're like, oh, you want to make your project is uh, two and a half inches wide and then uh, eight inches high, click OK, there's the project, there's the shape. And so that way you can make basic things. Uh, the same thing with the ellipse tool. If you click and drag that, it uh, can draw that out from there. You'll see that cross pop up every once in a while. That means that it is square. So like most times, if you want to make a circle, you want to make a circle, not an ellipse. So if you hold the shift key while you're scrolling, it keeps it in situation to make it a perfect circle every time. Cool. And, and so there's, you know, other tools as well, but, you know, you'll find a lot of the shapes that we want to build. We can just build with simple rectangles, circles, slots, ellipses. So these are kind of the basics and, you know, there's a few other ones, but they, they tend to have a little bit less uh, usefulness. One cool th one I really love is the polygon tool that if you pull this out and then you'll see it already starts off as a hexagon. But if you take this little plus or minus tab right here and pull this up, it'll actually change the size to whatever you want. So if you need something really quick, hexagon, septagon, octagon, we're getting crazy. Nice. Then that's always available. Cool. So, so that's shapes, right? You click the shape button, you click and drag. All right. So now let's say we need to talk about one other kind of important thing in Illustrator is stroke and fill. So every shape you put into your artboard, actually, you can assign a color of the fill, which is the kind of the, the whole area inside the shape. And then the stroke is the kind of the line on the outside. So when we, when we, when we set these a certain color, Origin's actually going to interpret what we want to do with those shapes. So for instance, uh, we have a whole uh, thing online where it shows if you use these certain fills and strokes, it's going to give you inside, outside, online, pocket, and guide. And, and they're typically white and black. Uh, we try to keep them very simple. Um, but it, it, you'll, you know, it's not something we need to go into full detail right now, but we have a, a template online that allows you to quickly reference those. And, and that's going to tell Origin exactly what you intend to do with this shape. Okay. So the, we do have this quick graphic style that you can find on the community uh, board that you can load up, which automatically assigns the specific color coding necessary. Uh, I think Ted will post the link to that. But once you get that installed, say you want to do an outside cut, hold this guy, bam, outside cut. You want an inside cut white fill, black stroke, inside cut. Uh, and so that can quickly assign all your different shapes to the cut you want. And it also keeps them organized so you don't get lost in this sea of white lines. Yeah, rather than thinking like, OK, a black fill and a white stroke gives me an inside cut, you can just look down at the bottom, highlight over it, and it'll actually tell you, uh, you know, this shaper style is, a, is an outside cut, which is super, super nice and mm -hmm. uh, easy to remember, right? So that. A black with a white is an outside. A white fill is an inside. So it, it just is easy to remember, and you don't have to think about it too much. Mm -hmm. So that's stroke and fill. Uh, and we're going to move on now to kind of moving and modifying these shapes that we've already put, because this is where we're getting into starting to get a little more powerful with what we can do with, or, uh, with uh, Illustrator. So why don't we start by like showing how we can move this uh, rectangle and make it actually bigger and smaller by? Yeah. So if you highlight it, it comes, brings up all the nodes. And so what every shape is, is just a combination of points that are connected together with lines. Um, so w one really big thing that takes some time to consider is the direct select tool and the uh, selection tool. So the selection tool, the left side, grabs the whole shape. And so when I grab this and move this around, it takes the whole thing with you. Um, if you want to scale, you can go down to the corner, you'll see the arrows pop up, and then you can make that bigger or smaller. 
um, the direct select tool that does individual nodes. And so if I grab this and pull this out, it breaks that and moves that independently from the rest of the shape. So you'll see us go back and forth between these two things. Um, most of the time, we'll be just using the direct select tool to move the majority of things. But if you want to move around individual points, that's how you can do it with the nodes. Yeah, and that's a super powerful one. And it takes some time to get used to that idea of being able to do object moving and point moving. Uh, a lot of times you'll be trying to move an object and be in the wrong mode and it won't move. Just remember, uh, am I trying to select the object or am I trying to select the individual points of the object? Mm, yeah, that is one of the most frustrating things early on is knowing what selection mode you're in and how things cover each other. Because even though this is all just points on a map, things do overlap each other. And so if something has a fill, you need to be careful because you try to reach for this shape and try to reach for the gray shape and it's underneath and then you grab the white one. And so you have to realize things are on top of each other, they're under each other, there are layers that can get in the way. One easy way to get out of this is if you grab both of those and get rid of the fill. If this decides to work for me. There it is. And kill that fill. You see, this is the, the big box is the fill and the outline is the stroke. And so you have to click on one to activate that. And then if you click the box with the line through it, that is, uh, negates it. So it takes it away. So there's nothing there. So that way you can reach for things inside of other things and they don't get in the way. That's bad. Yeah. I've okay. learned this from experience. This, <laughs> I, I feel like this program definitely taught me through experience. Uh, and it's one of those ones where, as we'll find out later, like going through little projects is a nice way to get comfortable with the type of tool set you'll need mm -hmm. uh, as we're going through the different ones. But yeah, let's, let's move on to this, the next one. This is not a hit the ground running. This is like baby steps, warm up, get more comfortable. And then you get frustrated and have to walk away from the computer for a while because you're so mad at it. And then you cool down, come back to it, and keep try again. This is a marathon, not a sprint. OK, so one thing that let's go over real quick, too, while we're here, because it kind of relates to this kind of what you're seeing. So if we make a few more of those rectangles and change the colors, I want to go over a little bit of like how the layering works in, in, uh, in Illustrator. So what you'll notice is you know, we now have four or five objects on this uh, on this artboard. And so each object is in a layer. And if we expand the layer uh, in, the, in yeah. the right hand, you'll see that now we can see each element in the artboard. OK? So you can see that right now the, the black rectangle is on top of all the other shapes. So if we're moving that around, it's actually going to cover up all the other ones. Now, if, if we need to see under it or we want it to be below, we can actually drag that layer down the bottom and then it'll automatically get relayered to a lower level which is super easy it makes it really easy to operate after you're building up your your projects but one of the things that's really cool is there's a shortcut that basically removes all the coloring from your artboard and so if you this is called like uh, what is it view outline outlines outline mode so mm -hmm. instead of seeing all the colors that you've put into your objects if you go to uh view with a view and then outline. outline. Now, all the colors disappear. We're only worried about shapes. When I'm working in Illustrator, I tend to work pretty much in this whole realm of shapes. And then later on, I'll worry about my offsets mm -hmm. and, or not offsets, my, my t cut types. You know, on Origin, you can always change those cut types on Origin. So if you're working on super simple projects, sometimes I don't even bother color coding. I export and go to the tool and change a couple paths. If it gets more complicated, at the end of the project or while you're working on it, you can start color coding. Yeah, you can change the cut paths on tool, but like the things that are most important are the vectors themselves. And so if you just want to work in outline mode, which the shortcut is control Y back and forth, uh, that is really the bread and butter of the things you want to worry about.
Yeah, and I, I find that when I'm having pr trouble selecting something or figuring out why I can't select it, going to outline mode, oh, I forgot. There's a bigger shape over that, and it's selecting that instead of the shape I want. So, so outline mode is kind of a huge, uh, awesome shortcut. I find myself using that command Y hotkey all the time. But as always, you can go up to the view and just toggle it. So, so that's outline mode. Um, OK, so next up, the most important feature of this whole thing is undo. So let, let's show this, because I, I find when I'm an illustrator, nothing I do more is undoing the last thing I did because it was wrong. Uh, Illustrator is great at remembering every little move that happens. So if, you, if you're so, moving stuff around. So all the time, you will be doing something, and you will accidentally click on the wrong thing, or you'll move something, or you'll delete the wrong thing, and you're like, dang it, and you want to go back. So the most important tool of this entire thing is Control Z. Uh, you can set how many it rem how many keystrokes it remembers in the settings, but it's set at about a hundred. So as long as you don't make a hundred steps in the wrong direction, which I've definitely made a hundred steps in the wrong direction and had to go back, but it's a pretty good way to save your butt if anything goes wrong. Um, or you try something out, you're like, I want to move it here, don't like it, Control Z, go back, and so it just keeps everything back where it was. Um, one thing you have to be careful of, Illustrator, like you can move things like a thousandth of an inch. And so if you want to make cuts and you want to move it over and then want to move it back, chances are of you hand placing it in the same position, things can get moved just a little bit. So that's why Control Z to keep it exactly where it was. Totally. Helps. Yeah, no, exactly, exactly the point there. So don't forget undo. I actually find that it actually helps me learn programs a lot easier when I can remember that I can do <laughs> any object or any manipulation, and then I'm one stroke away from going backwards. And that just helps me push want, through those hard problems. You want to teach yourself something, grab a random tool, try it out, realize that's not the tool you wanted, and then Control Z. Yeah, exactly. OK, so, so that's undo. Uh, next up, you know, we already went through layer view a little bit, but I, I would like to show people how to name uh, Mm -hmm. objects because I think you know as your scenes get busier and stuff just having the names set up correctly can sometimes be the change of like of understanding why something's not working um, yeah so say you were making a project and this was the material you're using it is a outside cut let's get rid of that and you wanted to cut this out but on the inside, you wanted to add a pocket. And so with this layer, we can double click on layer one, name this uh, back round, take that. What I like to do is when you're dealing with all these shapes on top of each other, you can accidentally grab the wrong one. So I like to, you can hit right next to the I button is the lock button. And so that takes it so you can't move anything. And if you make a new layer, it creates something right on top of it. So now I can add my pocket. These points are still referenceable. I can still like click on it, drag it, resize down, and then make my pocket on that. But I can't touch this at all. And so then we can name this pocket. For simple things, you don't really need to worry about layers if it's a quick little cut. But once you start getting into more complex signs uh, or something more intensive where you want to keep things independent and so you don't accidentally move something else, layers are definitely the way to go. Totally. Pro tip learn layers quickly <laughs> yeah and i even find like you know when you're creating new shapes they automatically get labeled as rectangle or circle or square or pin but it's really something that uh you know and then if you don't want to get confused with earlier things uh turn the back layer off and so now you don't have to worry about that it's a way totally yeah yeah like, while you're working on multiple stuff you can just move that around so mm -hmm. okay one thing that is so we're kind of going through all the basics that you need to learn as you're working on this. So, so one thing we should talk about here is kind of how to 
kind of position objects near, within, on objects. And, and Illustrator actually has a really awesome feature called Smart Guides. This is basically simple snapping that's kind of related to alignment of all your objects in the workspace or yeah. in your uh, artboard. So let's let's show a couple of the things about how that works and uh, explain exactly why you should be using this. So as you notice, every once in a while these pink lines pop up and those are the smart guides that kind of um, show reference to the different shapes. So right now this is connecting the center of the black triangle or black rectangle that I'm moving to the center of the gray rectangle. And so that keeps them aligned. However, if I were to move it over, it would snap into position because the, they are centered on each other. It might be a little hard to see, but yeah, it's like a little purple line that shows up. And, and let's say we make a small circle and we want to uh, connect it to the corner of this, uh, this rectangle. Yeah, you can it. see how easy it is. And actually really awesome to have things that just instantly snap to these areas, which is very common when you're working on origin. You want to snap the top of a circle mm -hmm. to a corner or to the top of it. So with every shape, uh, the center always pops up. So you can grab the center, tr grab that into the corner and leave it right there. If you wanted to grab, say, the top anchor, you can grab that into the corner and bam, it's aligned. Yeah, so this is super awesome. This is maybe one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. A lot of other programs do this too, but uh, I think Illustrator is one of the best. Mm -hmm. It really just, I find that I don't have to actually think about moving stuff around very often. I just, I'm kind of moving objects and snapping them with others and it, and it just seems to work quite well. Mm -hmm. So so that's the uh, smart guides. Um, so yeah, really powerful. You'll end up using it without even thinking about it at a certain point. Okay, mm -hmm. and you can always you you may have to turn those on up in the settings. Uh, in they're the, not always uh, turned on. Yeah, and so you can also adjust in the settings what smart guides you want, um, different variables. If you want center points turned on or off, uh, there's a plethora of um, setting options you can choose to customize it exactly how you want it. So almost everything can be changed. <laughs> yeah, so why, can you, why don't you show just a quick like uh, how, to, how to turn that on? Yeah, so I think if you go into preferences uh, and go into grids and guides, it shows the, you can change the color of the different guides. If you go into smart guides, uh, yeah, change color, change alignment guides. And you can pick exactly what it snaps mm -hmm. to. If you want to take off the anchors, that's done. If you don't want it to show measurements, um, yeah, so that, that's the preferences. They should be set up pretty well by default, but if you're finding they're not working, you can go up to view and then make sure that view, that smart guides right there has a check mark beside mm -hmm. it and that'll make sure they're on. If, you, if they're getting annoying and sometimes you're trying to get an object somewhere and it's snapping to something, just go into that, uh, hit control U or command U to toggle it on and off mm -hmm. and then you can place it wherever you want. So. And then so that's smart guys. Yeah. If you also want a little more uh, rigidity with how you're setting things up, you can turn on a snap grid, which will give you, I don't think it's showing up. But if you turn on the snap grid, it'll give you more uh, control over aligning things. Yeah. Okay, so next up, and this is kind of, we're getting to the meat of, of uh, Illustrator here. So this is Pin Tool. Pin Tool is kind of the, uh, kind of the master of vector design i think you know it's really powerful um, it does take some getting used to but we're going to just kind of show you the basics of pin tool mm -hmm. uh, i found that you know really the the most important part of pin tool is just using it uh, to make little things and then you'll find that it's it is going to be probably the thing you work with the most but you know let's let's show them some pin tool action so yeah so the pen tool uses a uh, bezier curves to when you click it auto let's get, let's get rid of that fill so we're just dealing with a stroke so it gets rid of so it does a nice curve and so at wherever you go it'll kind of like auto shape it into a nice curve so like let's say if we get rid of that and we want to make a shape so we can start like this want to make a number five 
um, we, if you click once, it'll create a curve. But if you double click, it'll create a sharp, sharp line. So double click, sharp line. Let's go back around. Let's go up here, up here. And this just kind of does a really quick free form and then go back to here. So notice this is not right. So then if we go back, double click, it changes it. Uh, this was definitely takes some getting used to. This has quite a learning curve. Most everything looks like trash straight off and then you have to clean it up a little bit. Um, this is really good if you put a photo behind it. We'll do a demonstration later. And then you can trace out any image, trace a signature, trace a shape. Um, if you scan in a shape, you can draw over this. Yeah, and, and one of the key points to remember here is, okay, so we now have created a pin tool shape that's a custom shape. It's not a rectangle. Mm -hmm. It's not a triangle. It's not anything. It's just a bunch of points with different curves on it. Now, and all these curves can be manipulated. So if you go yeah, exactly what I was to, to yeah. <laughs> beat you to it. <laughs> so if we go to the direct select, so we want to do the individual nodes, we can click on these nodes, and these handles show like the amount of curve. So if you want to, we can zoom in a little bit. So if we grab these handles, this manipulates the direction and the angle of the curve. And so if you want to move these around a little bit, you can definitely go back later and manipulate them to That's, exactly what yeah, you want. Each point has really three options, right? You can move the whole point or you can move the kind of the angle that it's extending out, right? Because Essentially, you should think of it as every point is affecting the next point. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, you know, this takes some getting used to. I mean, I, I found that a lot of time I'm in there changing these handles just a little bit, undo, changing it, you know, yeah. okay, I have to nope. change the different Jonesy. ones to get the right type, you know. So, so the pin tool is really kind of the, the really important part of, of the power of it. And, and all vector programs have pin tool, but, uh, you know, this one, if you're new to vector software, this is really one to get get really familiar with. Okay, so that's pin tool. Next up is my favorite, uh, which is called Shape Builder. So Shape Builder is a super cool one. Uh, probably when I saw it for the first time, I was like, wow, this is like amazing. So basically all you do with Shape Builder is you put a bunch of shapes on, a, on, a, uh, on your artboard of whatever you're trying to build, or just, you know, we're showing random shapes here, but later we'll get to some more specific examples. And Shape Builder allows you to kind of combine shapes that are not uh, just circles and squares, but really anything. So you can do a lot of really cool stuff with Shape Builder. And uh, so, for instance, let's say we wanted to do that five, and we, we built it with Pin Tool. We weren't quite happy. Let's try to build that five with just using shapes. So right here we have two circles. Uh, that's going to give us kind of the round of the bottom. And now we're going to kind of use Smart Guides to snap and move uh, around the top of the five, basically. Uh, that looks about good, yeah. And then another one to go across the top here. Okay, so now what we have is close to a five, but maybe not quite. Uh, but what we can easily do is add another line and near the bottom where maybe we want to cut the five off at. Okay, so now we have one, two, three, four, four different shapes that we're saying is part of this five. Now, all we have to do to make a five out of this is to go and select all the objects that we want to turn into one shape. So we would use our direct selection to select all five of these. Now, you can see they're in selected if you look over in the layer menu. And if you uh, expand that, you'll see, you know, each element has a small circle and kind of a double circle. The double circles are selected. The ones that aren't selected have no kind of second ring on them. So now we have our four or five selected things. Now all we do is go over to the palette menu and click on the Shape Builder tool. And if you highlight over any element in uh, uh, Illustrator, it'll kind of tell you what it is. And now you'll notice we're in this weird mode where when we move the mouse around, it's highlighting elements. So what we need to do now is we need to tell Illustrator these are the parts of the elements that we want to convert into a new shape. So if we just click the mouse and drag all the way through very carefully, you'll see it, it's, it's collecting them all. And then when you let go, it creates one shape out of those. Okay, so now one thing about Shape Builder is it does get confusing sometimes about 
you know, okay, so we made that shape. Now, like I said, it, you can always undo stuff. So I, if I didn't know what was the shape, I would grab the five and move it off. And what you would notice is, you know, okay, we have now one object that's a five, and then we have a bunch of other objects that Shape Builder kind of, it didn't throw them away, but it kind of just left them there as their own objects. So in our case, we only want the five. So we could go and delete the other, select the other area, and then just delete. And now we have our five. So that's really uh, Shape Builder in a whole, and it's uh, really awesome. I, I think that what you'll end up finding a lot of projects with Origin can be done with just Shape Builder and a couple squares, circles, uh, ellipses, and you'll find that this is one of the key ones. You know, there's one other element that we should go over while we're in Shape Builder land, which is uh, Pathfinder, which is similar to Shape Builder, um, but it doesn't have quite the option of doing uh, exactly what we just did. So. Pathfinder is more about Boolean operations on elements. Let's say we have a circle and a rectangle, uh, and we want to do some combining or uh, intersecting or subtracting of those elements. So if we, yeah, so we're drawing that, or drawing these out so you can see. Now, if we go to Pathfinder, now what you'll notice is we can actually say we want to convert this circle and the rectangle into a single object, and Pathfinder or Shape Builder can do that, but Pathfinder is a lot easier when you're not trying to select only certain parts. So if we selected both of them, we can go over to these shape modes, and uh, if we want to unite them, that means they come one shape, you get this, this, right? Uh, we can undo that and try the next one, which would be uh, minus, and, and all that's going to do is take one object away from the other. So now we have just a square with a with a kind of a chunk yeah. cut out of it. So it minus the front one, and so because the square was behind it, it cut out the Correct. circle. Yeah. And so yeah, a lot of things in Illustrator aren't entirely visible. Like if you're looking at it, there's no way to tell which is the top and the bottom. And so if you do some of these perform these uh, procedures, it does something you're not exactly sure how. It's because of the layering that is not completely visible. Yeah, so in, in like one thing I want to quickly go over, if we, if we take the, if we want to move that circle down to the bottom, we can just go to the direct selection, grab the circle and, and drag it down and you'll see that shape is moving and when we let go, the old shape disappears and then the new one uh, comes up. So mm -hmm. that's, you know, this is the basic Pathfinder stuff and I think that it can be super, super yeah. helpful with, and, you know, almost everything you're going to end up doing. And so say you wanted to, this was in the front, but you actually wanted to take away the rectangle when you did the, when you press the minus front. What you can do is you can change the directions, and so the layers. So if you take the rectangle, go into object, and then to, I always use the, key shortcuts, so I forget. A range, I think it is. It's yeah. a range. Up at the top, yeah. Ha, there it is. And so then you can take that and send it to bring it to front. And so now, if you highlight them all and then minus it, now it goes the other way. And it, we get a Pac-Man. <laughs> we get a Pac-Man. Okay, so so yeah, so this you know Shape Builder Pathfinder. This is the how you kind of take shapes, make them greater than the sum of each other, uh, and remove them. Mm -hmm. So that's that's really important. I find that it's super powerful when we're creating stuff. You can make a lot of different fixtures by using the basic shapes and combining them together to something more complex. Totally, even something like pulling a pulling an object out of some other program adding a rectangle in it and then subtracting that, that shape now gives you a jig that fits into the side of whatever elements you had. So there, there's a lot there, but yeah, go get, play around with Pathfinder and Shape Builder. They're really awesome. Okay, now I know I'm, people are probably like, when are you going to talk about text? Well, it's happening now. So this is one that's really powerful, maybe more powerful than most programs is the text in Illustrator is just top-notch. I mean, there, there's probably more uh, options than you'll ever need for Origin, but uh, when you want powerful text, this is kind of the place to do it. So if we go over there and we click the little T, we just drag out an area and that'll start a text object, okay? Now we're going to make it a little bigger uh, by scaling it up, yeah. just so grabbing that little corner. If you do the scale, it will 
to it and will warp it in whatever direction you pull it. But if you hold shift, it keeps it locked because stretch text is a nightmare. No one likes looking at stretch text. So keep shift and it keeps it in the right situation. Okay. And now that it's big, we can type whatever we want. And this so, is like a live text object. So what, what's, what's cool about this is we can just keep changing it as much as we want. We can say, you know, first we want this text, then we want that text. Now this is a text object in Illustrator, which is very specific to Illustrator. So we're going to talk a little bit later more about some specific text but, stuff when we go to Origin. But think about this as like, it's a live text. We can manipulate it. You know, I kind of showed it earlier how, you know, there's points that are being sh hidden underneath the UI, which you're not really, you don't need to know about. But right now, it's we can edit it to our heart's content. But one thing to worry about is there is not a very good uh, way to check misspellings. There's not a good spell checker on uh, a Illustrator. Oh, that's good. And so there are chronic misspellings happen all the time because it doesn't notify you. There is a way to check that, but it's not super easy. So just make sure to double check everything. If you're typing up something, it's always fun to throw it in like Word, type it out, and then copy and paste it into Illustrator just to double check. Totally, that's a great tip. And, mm -hmm. and so, so now, now that we're working with text, uh, we can change the font size, we can change the fonts, we can change all sorts of crazy specific things that designers really think about when they're talking about fonts. Uh, why don't we just show quickly like going through and trying to select the font? Because I think a lot of times when I'm working on a project and I'm doing sign or something, I'm saying, you know, how do I, how do I get the font that I want to look like in the sign? So if we just select the text and then go up to the top here, you can just scroll through the list and it auto updates everything. Uh, and you can kind of just get a feel for what's going to look right with the sign or element you're making. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing to mention is there's a, when you buy the, I believe this is correct, when you buy Illustrator, there's this whole font library that Illustrator also runs in the cloud. And that allows you to sync these fonts of all specific types. And people can create fonts. And you can get them into your computer quickly. And, and there's just so many fonts. I think it's called Adobe Typekit, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, but this is, I actually really like it. You know, From Illustrator, you can go straight into a browser where you can search for you know, what type of font. I want a medieval font that looks uh, a serif, or mm -hmm. I want, you know, like this. They have classifications. So you can filter the fonts. the fonts you have based on the different characteristics. So say you want something more bold and you want something a little more ornate. Oh, man, there's nothing with that. Okay, we got two little adventurers there. So let's go back. Okay, so a bold serif font. Here are our options. So this is what is downloaded on my computer. If you go to Adobe Fonts, there are tons more you can download. And what's really cool is they have a program where you can send a picture of a font in, uh, and it'll analyze that font and give you the closest matching fonts to try to match whatever you want. Yeah, wow, that's cool. So, so you know, there's also you know all the the specifics of this font. So once we've selected a font, now we can change all the specifics of it. So let's, let's just pick uh, one of these that uh, we want to show off real quick. Yeah, so let's go, um, what's the name? OK. So and w if you want to make changes, you can go into the character option, press that. And this, there is a lot of powerful functionality here. But what it is is just manipulate all the instance of the font. Like you want to stretch it out a little bit, you can do that. You want to make it taller, you can do that. You want to uh, pull out the kerning, which is the shape in the space in between the letters, you can do that. You want to, if there are multiple lines and you want to change the space in between lines or the letting, you can change that. So like there's a lot of powerful adjustments that like you can't find in Word or anything else, almost too much. But yeah, and, really and want to get like you probably with most of the projects, you're going to find a font you like, and they're pretty well designed in the first place. But mm -hmm. you know, there's times where you may need to make things a little bigger and smaller. Okay, one thing to talk about fonts before we move on is, like I said, this is a live object in Illustrator, their own kind of custom understanding of what a font is. Now, in order to get this font on the origin and cut it, we only need to do one simple thing. Well, it can get complicated, but we're going to keep it simple. So. 
if we direct select the object and right click, what you're going to see is a couple of different options. This is pretty common when you're working in Illustrator, but this is really important. Create outline. So now we've gone from a live text to outline text. And then what you'll notice is we now have, instead of uh, just one object that we can select, because when it's a live text, you can't actually do uh, the other selection method. Now that we've converted to outline, you'll notice all these letters are just turned into points, right? So now we cannot no longer edit the text and we can't change the text we can't change the type the font anything now what we can do here which is kind of cool is changing the points in the text so if we decide hey we really want the top of the u to be a little shorter than that we can go in and just edit those points and we couldn't do that when it was a live object so sometimes you have to work back and forth between live objects and outlines uh, what i find that's super useful too sometimes is to make a copy of the the live text and then convert one of them but then you have the old one and you can kind of hide it in the in the layers panel so that you you know if you do find out you know three hours later in this project that you need to change the text you don't have to start over you can already have it and you can just modify it so yeah. that's text uh, and this will export right on the origin and cut I will say you know there's obviously the router bit uh, conundrum that you have to think about when you're working with these uh, objects which is I'm cutting text especially if I'm doing like an inside cut, I'm cutting text with a bit that's round and I need to make sure that bit can fit everywhere. So we're gonna go over a little tip that I like to do, which is creating a small circle, the size of your bit. So in this case, we're gonna do, maybe we're doing an eighth inch cut because uh, we have our awesome eighth inch collet and we're just gonna cut in these letters with it. So if you make this shape that's that size, you can now take that object and kind of drag it through the objects that you've created and just make sure that it's roughly going to fit everywhere. If you get to a place, especially if you're doing those script letters that you see a lot online, where they get really thin in some areas, this is a way to say, you know what, that area is too thin. I'm just going to make it a little bit thicker. You know, the font we picked is pretty, pretty uh, normal. So there's not many like thick and thins, but you know, there's times where like that would be like a real, maybe origin will not fit here. If it's bigger than the circle, it's not going to fit. So that's just something to keep in, uh, keep in mind while we're doing this, but uh, it is super uh, useful, I found. It's a kind of a little hack to just make sure your file is going to work so you don't export it, get the origin, find out, oh, my bit doesn't fit. Uh, you can do this in software. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a really quick gut check to just make sure that everything's going to fit. You can kind of just make sure, pan around, and before you export it and place it on your file and then put in the drill bit and then you're like oh it doesn't fit now i have to go all the way back yeah. so this definitely saves you some yeah so time. And, and maybe while we're on the subject of this maybe we should show a quick uh cornering so like let's make, make a quick square and do that same kind of trick so you can kind of get an idea of what we're talking about so if we just do a regular uh rectangle uh and then make a circle that would be a quarter inch. Now, when we drag that and zoom into the corner, you'll actually see that we're not gonna get all that area cleared out, no matter what we do, right? Because this is the bit going around the corner. We're gonna leave a little bit there. And when you're looking at fonts, you're gonna be able to tell, hey, we're not gonna be able to get into that, that corner of the font. Now, Origin will do some very smart stuff where we'll say, hey, you know, we know we can't cut this rectangle, but we can cut most of it if that's cool with you and you can kind of play with that on the fly if, if that's you know it's close enough to what you're looking for but this is a good way to make sure that you can at least fit so mm -hmm. all right so i think we we're getting we're at well, what 40 there's minutes a now. quick way to change the corners which is if you click onto the rectangle up in the you can top of the corners you can grab this little circle and if you grab that and pull it in, that'll change the corner radius. And so you can corner that. Yeah, that's done. a nice tip too. I use that one a lot when it's like, you just want the corners to fit, uh, especially if you're doing inlays or something, you really need the, all the corners to be curved so they just mm -hmm. inlay right. and fit well. Done. Okay. Um, all right, so let's see what we have left. I've got a couple last minute things to do, and then we're gonna jump into some projects. So uh, one, little tip I wanted to do real quick is called object offsetting. So there's a lot of times, especially with this font, maybe maybe we're going to do, instead of the whole font, we're just going to do one letter. But we want to cut kind of a, 
a stepped letter where maybe the inside of the letter is higher than the outside. And maybe let's take this S for example. Um, maybe we want to take that file we've done and we, we really want just a little bit bigger of an S. So if we go in and we select that object, we can basically tell Illustrator with some of its kind of more pro side tools like, hey, take this object we have and offset all the edges. And, mm -hmm. and that'll give us just an offset around the whole path of this that is, you know, whatever size away from it that we really want it to be. So we go to object, path, and then offset path. And you'll see right now, we can type in offset, we can see a preview. Mm -hmm. We can even tell it the type of like software that it's using for how it thinks about corners and stuff and the limits there. I normally don't mess with that. It's normally uh, fine. But here you'll see now we have an offset path that follows that exact shape and it's offset by uh, 0.05 inches. So that, that's super good for uh, a lot of stuff. We, I find I'm doing origin where mm -hmm. it's like, you know, I just want that little bigger or I want to do a double path where I'm engraving this S and I want two lines to go around the S. Uh, th that's a really cool little tip that, yeah. that works. If we were going to cut it and want to make it a little bit bigger just to make sure that drill bit went through, uh, we can make it just pump everything up a little bit and give it a little more breathing room. Now, one thing that is interesting is you can always do this on tool. Um, so, right, you can you can go on tool, take the shape, change the offset. Uh, it'll instantly process that path, and it basically gives you the same exact thing. But if, for instance, we wanted to cut every letter like this with a with a second offset, it'd make a lot more sense to put it straight into a file. So that when you're cutting the file, you don't you don't miss it or forget mm -hmm. to do the offsets. But that's kind of like an ideal font that we were using. But so if we want to use something that like doesn't it isn't as super situated for origin, we can take a letter that is has some corners to it that will be harder to cut. We can create the outline for it, and then if we wanted to do an object and then do a path, offset path, and then maybe just like a point zero 0.05, and then turn that to round. Oh, 0 0.05 is way too big. 0 0.005. Yeah, and sometimes with Illustrator, I find you have to turn the preview on and off for it to take effect. Mm -hmm. And so then that gave us a little more space, rounded the corners. You do have to make sure that it doesn't blow out the center, but that is an option for a bigger letter. And then you can just kind of take that letter, delete that, and now you have your blown out letter that is more yeah, millable. Okay, so the last thing before we go into a couple little projects that is, okay, what do we need to do to get this to origin? That's always the question. Okay. Yeah, maybe I do already know Illustrator, but what do I need to do to get it ready for origin? So, so one tip, like we showed, using that circle to check bit sizes around the about around your area. Two is the color coding. Uh, we went over that earlier, where you're making sure the fill and the stroke is correct for whatever you're looking for. Uh, there's two options there. One is using the template that we have on the support page, which is kind of a, this thing where you just open the template up, and then it's kind of got inside of the artboard it's already got the colors and a little like kind of palette for each type and you can just kind of use the eyedropper tool to select your object and then use the eyedropper tool to to click that that's that's something we have online there's a lot of info on that i actually believe that that file comes installed on the usb when when you get origin so that's another way to get it and then obviously there's sam's palette which is an installable plugin for illustrator that you can just quickly uh, select your object and change it. Like right now, because it's black, that would be an outside cut. We maybe want an inside cut. We can just select it all, click the white one, and now it does it. If we want guides, we can select the blue line one. That turns it into a guide. Origin will not be able to cut this. It will just tell you and show you on screen. So color coding is one of the things I like to think about when I'm almost done with the project. It's, it's, uh, it's kind of, it can get in the way for me as I'm working. Okay, now the next thing while we're exporting for origin, we already talked about if you're using text, you need to change it to uh, outlines first. If you try to import something in the origin that doesn't have an offset, origin will say unable to import file. And, and it's likely related to this in some cases. Um, but 
the key when you're exporting for origin is not to use export. You actually want to save as. Cool. So this is first before oh. we save, we want to change the artboard because the when saving it, uh, the artboard shows up as an icon. And so we want to get that artboard as small as possible. This is not necessary, but this is a nice way to. Yeah, and help. that just fits the artboard exactly to whatever mm -hmm. objects you have. So um, object and that's, board, that's a nice, you don't have to do this, but it's a nice way to make mm -hmm. the thumbnail show up better on Origin. Uh, it'll look cleaner when you're on there. So, so now we're ready to export. Uh, and actually, you know, before we do this, I want to go over one other little pro tip here. So we export it, we're exporting this uh, text out. And, and if we wanted to make a change, uh, and we needed to re-import that on Origin later, we would have to either you know, visually place it, or if we had a grid set up, we would go back and set it to the right thing. But what's going to happen is Origin's going to kind of create the bounding box for whatever you export. Uh, now, in this case, we don't have a bounding box set. So mm -hmm. Origin's just going to take the text and create its own bounding box. Now, the, the fact that we have kind of done this fit the artboard is changing, but maybe undo that. I want to show uh, one little thing. So if if we think about this, there's going to be a little bounding box drawn around this text when we import, but let's say we wanted to change one word afterwards. What we can do is, if we, drag, if we just drag a rectangle around this whole object, and it can be a little bigger, it doesn't really matter what it is, if we keep the text in this rectangle, and then we export this on the origin, and make the rectangle a guide, that's not cuttable, but it helps the placement of this text, right? Uh, when we go back and we change the text, if, as long as we don't change where the text is in relation to the bounding box, we can then re-import that same file and using the grid feature on Origin where we're aligning to material, we can then replace this file and keep working. So let's say we had made a spelling mistake in the last word. We can edit that, re-export it. As long as we had set it up with a grid in the first place, we'd be able to just keep working, which is a really cool uh, pro tip uh, when it comes to using grid on origin and being able to update your files because uh, yeah. once you cut it into wood and then you realize sean really isn't a super cool guy if you realize he's not a super cool guy you might want to change it without restarting your project mm -hmm. okay so so all right so now we need to go and so like i said there's two options here export and save as you do not want to use export uh they do crazy things to the export we want to do save as so we're gonna save as a svg file and all we have to do is go here and type click the svg option uh and then when we we name our file whatever we want it to be this is definitely going to be version one i think <laughs> okay. Uh, okay so when we click save now we have a few options but normally these are pretty good by default but really what you want to make sure is the well, no these are not great by default. And so on the uh, on the support page, on the support we, page. Have a, we have an image of what these should be. Um, you can see right here, it's actually auto-converting fonts to outline. Um, so that can be uh, a thing you can use if, you're, if you don't want to convert to outline. I like to do it because uh, you never know what may happen because the computer's doing it for mm -hmm. you. Um, but you really want that presentation attributes as your CSS properties. Decimal places four is good. Uh, that means you're getting get quite a bit of accuracy when you're exporting. And then you just hit OK, and it mm -hmm. will save that file out. And it's easy as that. So we save the file. We can either put it on USB or upload it to ShaperHub, and then we're done. So that's pretty much it um, for exporting and the basics of Illustrator. I know you know we went over a lot here, but I, th I think we're going to try to we're going to try to go over a few minutes and show a couple simple projects because. One of the things we haven't even gotten to is how to convert images to vectors. And we want to make sure we go over that yeah. before we wrap up. So, so what Eric's going to take it away and do a couple simple projects, just kind of start to finish so you guys can get a quick look on how it works. So one of the most uh, useful tools on Illustrator, the, one of the reasons to spend the money is for this uh, feature called Image Trace, uh, which is pretty unique. Um, Adobe, no, sorry, uh, Affinity doesn't have this, and so it's definitely worth yeah, spending so in money. Inkscape has Inkscape a similar version, has uh, a decent I, version. It works. I have never got it to work that well, but I've heard people have. Mm -hmm. uh, Affinity does not support image to vectors, but uh, Illustrator really shines here. Mm -hmm. and, and 
we're going to walk through this. So remember in the beginning we talked about images have, you know, there's raster images and then there's vector. And this one here that we're looking at right now, as you can see, is super blurry. This is our image, a PNG or, vector, or a raster image that we've imported into, into okay. Illustrator. And now we're going to use this software inside of Illustrator to convert it to points. Now, I, I do want to get kind of lead out with this, which is this doesn't always work. And depending on how complex your image is, depending on the quality, there's a lot of, of stuff that can make it very difficult. It can also get very complex where it takes, you know, a couple minutes while it's crunching uh, the computer to figure out, you know, what is actually going on. And, and sometimes it's not actually usable on origin. So this is one of the things I think Eric does really well, which is, you know, in Assist, a lot of people are saying, hey, I really want this image turned into something I can cut on origin. I want a logo. I want a picture of a person. And, and so these are some of the things you can use. And you'll notice sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, mm -hmm. But I do find that this is one of the better versions of that, and, and we'll go through that one with this A now. Yeah, so this tool can be very powerful. Uh, it can also make a lot of problems, so it definitely takes some trial and error practicing, adjusting to get exactly what you want. Ideally, when you're image, using Image Trace, you want like a high quality black and white photo with really clean lines that's what works the best but once you get into lower quality you get into like some muddled colors then it gets a little questionable so when you first start image trace there are a few a lot of different presets you can do uh, high fidelity which will get as many colors as you want uh, minimal colors grayscale but if we're doing just this logo we can just do black and white logo and that's basically like a preset where i'm, I'm sure they spend a lot of time mm -hmm. trying to make them work correctly um so i do find that picking the right preset really will get you quite far but like as you saw like that isn't the same like it's it's okay uh it but you always go into the advanced menu and adjust these and these will the sliders will change the number of paths and the corners uh Pro tip is I always go to like in the mid 90s to add paths. And as you see, it live updates and it's resampling trying to trace the raster image because that's not a clean line. So it's trying to guess where that line is. And depending on how you change the settings, how you change the threshold, uh, how you change its like sample size with the noise, it's trying to find the best path. And so you have to really adjust this to find what exactly you want. If you go to 100, it freaks out. So never go to 100. Oh, like mid 90s gives you something pretty clean. But again, this isn't perfect. So once you... And this is a pretty simple one, right? These little black and white where it's like very either black or white, it's, it, that's pretty good. You're going to get a pretty good outcome most mm -hmm. of the time. But if you just take an image that you love, throw it in here, you're gonna get so many points. Uh, it's gonna be really hard to work with. And, and the you know. one problem with this is sometimes it gives you too much data. Like sometimes it's easier to trace an image with the pen tool than it is to image trace it and then try to like delete out all the extra information that you don't need. So you want to get it pretty good. Um, then this is still an image and it won't become vector lines until you hit expand and now that you have expand its lines and so like initially that's pretty good but we can go back and make some adjustments sometimes this will be perfect straight off the bat but it almost always requires a little finesse yeah and like we were showing earlier this is where you'd run the circle kind of that circle that's representing your bit through because we're getting some thick lines and some thin lines and we want to make sure that everything fits. So now that we've converted it, we're not done. We can't just say convert this image and then go to origin and cut it. We really need to like probably going to have to come in and change some of these areas. So mm -hmm. for instance, like if we drag this over there. Uh, there. Okay. So drag it through like that. You'll see that doesn't fit there. So mm -hmm. we actually need to manipulate those points around that. And, and this is where you're going to have to make a call of, hey, you know, I really want to modify the image a little bit so that I can 
do an inlay or cut the whole area. If I just want to engrave on the top of these lines, that's, that's another option. You don't really have to worry too much. But if you want to cut the outside or the inside mm -hmm. like that, we're not going to be able to cut any of that, that error in the area in the corner if we're doing inside cut here. So we have the option of just taking the tool. The tool will decide what it can and can't cut. Or we can come in with a direct selection tool direct and selection. start changing these points in now that they're converted from an image to make that area bigger mm -hmm. where the bit will fit through. So this, yes, is, just... this is like standard practice, I think, when you're trying to convert images. There's really no simple, you know, mm. hit a button, you get it out, and now it works. So there is a lot of work involved. And, and, you know, I think a lot of the stuff that we see people struggle with is, hey, I have this image. How do I get it into origin? We, we wish it was simpler, but there, there is some stuff here that we think helps. You know. One thing that I forgot to do was it, when we converted it, I did not click the ignore white button, which doesn't make a shape of the white area. So since we converted it, we have this this white. Oh, let me ungroup that because it's grouped. This white is its own thing. And so that can really throw you off. If you're trying to make things, we just move that line and we saw a double line pop up. That's when you get multiple shapes on top of each other. That can really be confusing. So we just delete that out of the way. And then there will be a white piece in here. We delete that. Now, if we check in the layer, it's just that and my uh, little bit shape. Okay, so that's the basics of changing an image into a vector. All right, now let's go into another one, which I think we want to go into the signature. So, you know, this is really classic. You have a signature you want to put into your pieces and you want to use origin to inlay that. So mm -hmm. this is a photo that uh, our signature Eric made uh, and then he my, drew it and took a photo of it. My beautiful signature. It is a very beautiful signature, I must say. Yes. So, so how do we get this in? You know, we could try the image trace, maybe because it's on paper, it's giving image trace a lot of problems. Yeah. It might work, it might not. So That's like kind of always, I feel like image trace. It's always Russian roulette when I'm yeah, it's, using it's gonna trace. be, it's yeah, gonna so, think about it for a while. It's gonna freak out for a second. It can be very heavy on a computer too. This is, sometimes it's uh, a process that takes a while. So uh, depending on how heavy your image is. It's, uh, it's not gonna work out, yeah. So we're gonna have to do this one another way. So. Yeah. So with converting a signature, there are a few ways to do it, but none of them are great. What I found is just hand tracing the thing. And so if we throw this image in, we have a picture, uh, and then we're going to draw on top of it. But first, we don't want to mess up between clicking on the image and the points and our lines. So we're going to lock this layer. Actually, first, because this is so dark, we're going to take this and we're going to change the opacity of it, which is, sometimes it pops up, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, properties beside the layers. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah, so there's a hop bar up here which gives you what most time it gives you what you it thinks you need and most of the time it does but on the off chance it doesn't then you have to go hunt for them so let's change that to 50 percent no still image uh, tracing <laughs> see this is if you're not using your stuff get rid of it because then you accidentally click it okay so now it's 50 percent, so it's easier to view our thing so if we go back to layers we can lock this layer and then go on to our second layer. And so everything we do now is on top of this and we can't move. So let's zoom in a little bit and go to the curvature tool. So this, again, definitely requires some practice. But what you can do, I like initially, once you get the hang of it, you, can, you know where the lines are going to go. And so you can put, plan out your points. But what I like to do straight off the bat is just throw a rough line up and just kind of follow along, double click for a straight line, double click and outline that and just follow your signature. 
So if you get too close to the line, you'll click on the line itself, and then it'll click on this point and not create a new one. So you have to kind of go outside. Let's go back. Okay. Create right, we that. can always update those points later. So well, sometimes you'll find you have to move them away, and then after you finish it, we'll drag yeah. them around and get them a little clear. Lay it out first. And then once you do that, we'll put a stroke on this. And you'll look at that, and you'll like, that looks like trash. Because it does. Always tr the first time. But then, you can, it always looks bad at first. But what you do is you grab onto this and then adjust your nodes a little bit. Bring these overlapping parts together. Bring these overlapping parts together. And then my favorite tool is the smooth tool. And so once you click on the smooth tool, what you do is just tra run over a number of times and it'll flatten out your curves to something nice and beautiful. And what you have to do is just trace this through. Yeah, smooth tool is also really nice if you're working with really complex geometry. Mm -hmm. So maybe someone on ShapeRub has, has used an exporter for an image and now you have thousands or millions of points. You can just use the smooth tool uh, and if you click and drag, it'll actually do just the areas around where you've done it. If you just click the area once, it'll actually smooth the whole thing to a certain point. And there's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of settings you can tweak there to kind of get it. But, but I think what you'll find is, you know, no single setting is going to work for all your projects. So you kind of are always adjusting the settings a little bit to say, I want it to go a little smoother or I want to do harsher treatment here. So. So you just need to get used to all the little panels that come with every tool. Mm -hmm. um, and every tool has like, you know, 10 or 15 options. And, that, and that's going to really change the way it, it works. Okay. So, And so when you have placed all these nodes down, you can also move them. And so you can just yeah, click and drag, move that, move that and around. And we're using the direct selection for those points, right? So. You know, the main object selection is for the entire, because, right, we created one object out of all these points, but we're going back in to change the specifics. So, remember, getting used to which, which selection mode you're in, uh, you know, after you do it a couple times, you'll, it'll make total sense. And it actually works really well once you get used to it, but it, it is kind of a weird thing to get used to in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And then you can even go back and make your signature a little cooler than something you couldn't even draw. So like say if you grab this, pull these nodes out, and then flip them around. Just wait, this is going to work. It's going to be cool. Again, this definitely takes some practice. You can do a nice little like swirl with your signature. Because my handwriting has never been that good, but on Illustrator, and so when you engrave your signature into your work piece, it can actually be a better version of yourself. Yeah, and I think one of the things to remember when we're working with text on Origin, right? So this is a single element. So when we go to Origin to cut this, we're going to follow the paths back and forth. So for instance, when we go over the eye, we're going to go up, and then we're going to come back kind of on that same line. And that's going to keep us from having to plunge and retract a couple times. So if you're doing kind of signature script stuff, it's, it's actually really nice to be able to, you know, keep them as one element and it makes the, the, the cutting experience quite nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we need a little dot for the eye. And then if, what you can also do is once it's sized, you can highlight it and then adjust the thickness to what the actual engraving will be. And so if the width of your engraving bit is 0 0.02, change the stroke to that. Oh, it's in points, not inches. Oh, yeah. OK, you have to make sure you put inches. Yeah, this zero is kind of a little point. point zero you know, when two. you set up a document, you have to tell it you know, what type of uh, dimensions you want to work in, but almost all the in input boxes, you can just remove the the type of point or inch or millimeter and just type it in and it'll auto convert it to whatever you're working mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. 
And so then if we adjust that, beautiful. And so say if you want to adjust the size, you want this to be uh, like a two inches wide by one inch, you can make that box, highlight this, group it, which keeps everything together, your different points. I like to copy and make a new one. And then let's change this color to make it a little easier to see. Actually, let's just go. Okay, look at that. And book. And then we can put this, shrink this down to the size we want it. And then if we change the point to 0 0.02 inches. That will show you how thick it will be at that size. That's a cool trick. Yeah. So then you can ex exactly know like how it's going to look on origin when you're, you know, cutting that deep and with that size bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's, that's that. I think we have one more quick one, which we're going to kind of put a lot of the shape stuff that we talked about in the beginning to, uh, to kind of show you how to build a quick MFT table. So we do this, we have a lot of people that want to know how to do this, but we're gonna quickly show you, you know, if you wanted to do something like an MFT table, how would you do that in okay. Illustrator? And it's quite uh, cool. So super quick, what you can do is, first you wanna start your rectangle and our MFT, the one we're using for this this tool table is, uh, we're at 43 point five inches wide, and then we're at 28.25 inches high. So that's our table straight off the bat. Let's kill that fill just to make it easier to work on. And so now we have to make all of the holes in it. So these are 0.75 inches. Let's just make that 0 0.75, 0 0.75. And it, the first corner is offset 2.75 inches from the edge. Uh, there's a couple ways to do this. Using your smart guides, you can just set it into the corner. And then if you want to transform and then move, you want to go horizontal 2.75 and then vertical 2.75. Oh, we gotta do negative 2.75. So that is where the first hole in this table is. Now, the next one is gonna be 3.75 inches vertical. So if we go to transform move, and then go to 3.75 with zero horizontal. What I do is say again. I don't think it took the, the zero. There we go. And so then copy, then we create another one. And so there was a really cool feature called duplicate, which is if you do control D, it just does that same thing again. D. Yeah, whatever you last did. So any option, any action you've done, if you do Command D, it'll do it again. So this is kind of a really slick way to quickly generate kind of patterns. Uh, they're not editable, uh, so they're they are very kind of hacky in that sense. But uh, I find that they're like kind of a really magical, mm -hmm. quick patterning tool. And then once we get all of the ones on one side, do that exact same thing. Transform move and do horizontal 2.75 with the vertical zero. And then copy those, control D, 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 D. And now we have a beautiful MFT table. Yeah, like it's that quick to create your geometry multiply it, keep it all in line, and to crank out 
some pretty complex pieces pretty quickly. All right, so I think that's going to do it for us this week. Uh, I want to thank Eric for showing us all this cool stuff. Uh, as always, you know, Shaper Assist is there to help you when you get in trouble or you don't want to worry about this stuff in the first place. Mm -hmm. So, so I've done. I do this every day and I've made all these mistakes. And so if you have any questions, send them my way. Happy to help and point you in the right direction to s save you from making the mistakes I did. And so whatever you have, any project, want to convert a picture, you or just have an idea, send it to Shaper Assist and we can help build those files. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. We will see you next week.